Hi, everybody. Hello. Hello. Nice to see you. We might still have a few more people coming in from downstairs. Um, as we're getting ready to start, for I think I know most, most people here already, my name is Suzanne Murray. I'm the um, program director for the Global Health Team here at Smithsonian, at the, at the SEBI, Smithsonian Conservation Biology Institute. I'm very happy to welcome everybody here. I'll be the MC for this afternoon, introducing our speakers. Uh, we're very proud and uh, to have you, everybody here at Smithsonian, so thank you very much for traveling here, especially those who came from far away. Uh, for a real introduction, though, I'd like to first introduce Dr. Steve Montfort. Dr. Montfort is a DVM PhD. He also has ties to UC Davis. He's been the director of the Smithsonian Conservation Biology Institute for a long while, and he's the acting director of Smithsonian's National Zoo, uh, hopefully soon to become permanent on that, and has been a very strong supporter of research and um, uh, this, uh, and, uh, and this program in particular. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Steve, my good friend and colleague. Yeah. Thanks, Steve. Well, thanks everyone for coming, and uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the Smithsonian Institution. And I don't know how many of you know very much about the Smithsonian, but it has, I think, the best um, mission on Earth, which is the increase and diffusion of knowledge. And so a program like PREDICT, I think, is, embodies that same philosophy of increasing knowledge and sharing that knowledge to you know, improve the world, let's hope. Um, you probably don't know, though, that we do a lot of work in conservation science. It's one of our hidden secrets. And if you, you look at our institution, we have the largest collection of biodiversity specimens on Earth. We have an environmental research center on the Chesapeake, the Tropical Research Institute in Panama, the zoo, and the Conservation Biology Institute. And uh, not until just fairly recently, we were, we were saying things like, we seek to uh, study and understand biodiversity. That was part of our science plan about a decade ago. Uh, there was a pivot that occurred when we did our, our last strategic plan, which we, we, we said we were going to understand and sustain biodiversity. And the Conservation Biology Institute became a leader in the institution of trying to pull people together you know, based on the fundamental premise that biodiversity and functioning ecosystems are a value to current and future human societies. A very simple premise, but one that we were kind of late to really adopt. And if you look around the institution today, we have hundreds of scientists, core scientists, federal scientists, doing biodiversity and conservation-related research. Not many of them might call themselves conservation biologists, but if you ask any of them how many of them do research that can aid uh, in conservation uh, solutions, every hand will go up. And you add on to that hundreds of trainees, postdocs, and graduate students, and, and building the next generation in this area is really an, becoming an important theme. So we've, we've put all this under something called the Smithsonian's Conservation Commons. It's really our one Smithsonian approach to trying to be greater, the whole being greater than the sum of the parts, and how can we use our science to help solve conservation problems. So if we believe in sustaining biodiversity for the benefit of, of humankind, we really can't separate um, humans from wildlife and uh, also domestic livestock. And so understanding those relationships is, is essential to sustaining biodiversity. And we've all sort of come to that same uh, mountaintop, that, that today we're talking about managing landscape mosaics and humans are part of biodiversity and they're part of those landscapes. So the Smithsonian Global Health Program led by uh, Suzanne uh, just a few years ago uh, on the backs of, of her involvement with the PREDICT program has really, um, has really been a fantastic addition to our efforts. I think she's grown to something like 15 or 17 staff in, in three years. And we've been um, very fortunate that the, the two prime countries we're working in, Myanmar, where we've been for nearly 30 years, um, since 1992, and also in Kenya, where we've had a really long history, we've been able to um, piggyback Suzanne's work on the back of our existing research and our existing uh, uh, partnerships in places like Impala in Kenya, or working with uh, on our BAT program, looking at movement and landscape ecology in that country. So it's been a very um, efficient and great use of adding, layering on, uh, you know, looking at uh, pandemic disease threats onto our, into our biodiversity and conservation portfolio. And the other thing um, that we're starting to try and do better is to use our public venues. We, we have 30 million visitors that come and see us every year and more than 200 visitors to our websites and our, through our social media, we can reach even more. So we're really thrilled we had um, you know, the outbreak exhibit over at Natural History and if you haven't had a chance to see that, I would encourage you 
to go there. So I, I just want to end by saying we're so um, we're really excited because the partners are such high quality. I know from um, everything I'm hearing from Suzanne, you know how proud she is to be part of that network. But that's you know we we really love it when we find partners that share our values and our work ethic and our whole. Uh, philosophy of, of not only increasing and sharing knowledge, but also really focusing on building capacity. You know, not just human capacity, but institutional capacity in the places where we work. It's one of the hardest things that we will ever do. It's one of the things that we failed at a lot. And so I really like the idea that this program, PREDICT, really has that as part of their, their core uh, principles. So thank you so much for coming. Um, is there anything I can do to make your, your afternoon more pleasant? Please let me know, but thank you very much. Thank you, Steve. We really appreciate that. Um, a special uh, thank you and welcome to our U.S. aid partners. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce Richard Green. Since um, April of 2016, Richard's been the Senior Infectious Disease Strategy Advisor for USAID's Office of, uh, of Health, Infectious Disease, and Nutrition, and he also serves as a lead on the Global Health Security Agenda. Prior to this position, Richard served for more than 30 years in the U.S. Foreign, as a uh, U.S. Foreign Service Officer. Uh, retiring from the, from the Foreign Service in, 15, in 2015 with the rank of Career Minister. Uh, he began his career as a U.S. Uh, uh, Peace Corps volunteer in the Ivory Coast, where he provided assistance to the National Immunization Program, so he has a long history and interest in health. Please help me in welcoming Richard. Thank you so much. Thanks for that great introduction, which is probably longer than my introductory remarks. But uh, uh, I want to welcome everybody and um, I just say that the, predict, the USAID PREDICT project, uh, established in 2009, uh, has worked in over 30 countries to help detect emerging disease threats at their source. And those are probably the key word which makes it uh, a unique uh, um, uh, uh, program. And it is now probably the most comprehensive effort to date to detect, identify, and characterize major zoonotic threats. And there are major zoonotic threats um, uh, very much in evidence. For instance, you may have heard about the new Ebola outbreak in eastern Congo in a very highly insecure area that already has 133 cases. This followed on a month earlier, or three months earlier, a separate Ebola outbreak in, um, uh, 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 in uh, um, Equator province of DRC, of which the PREDICT project did help determine that those two outbreaks were not linked and not identical, which is very useful. So we do have a lot of zoonotic threats, not only today, but seems to be increasing for a number of reasons. In any case, on behalf of USAID, I would certainly like to recognize the highly valued contribution of the PREDICT program to the, to the entire global health security effort. Uh, uh, personally, looking back, there's a few accomplishments among many that I'd like to highlight, beginning not only with the identification of it, of novel viruses, including a new Ebola virus identified by PREDICT with the government in Sierra Leone, uh, which is the first uh, instance of identifying a new Ebola virus prior to that causing illness in humans or in animals. But also another important accomplishment in my mind is just establishing the ability to do uh, national uh, to do wildlife sampling in these countries. Without being able to do wildlife sampling in a safe way and an ecologically appropriate way, it's impossible to get the samples that we need to determine the threats that are out there, um, uh, particularly from virus. Also, national capacities in laboratories. Um, the, uh, Equator outbreak that I mentioned in Congo and Ebola was the first instance in Congo that they were able actually to identify, detect the Ebola virus in country. 
So establishing this laboratory capability in these countries so that they can identify uh, and even characterize uh, and, uh, and viruses um, without shipping them out is a very, very important accomplishment. Uh, behavior change surveys. This is very important to determine the links with be human behavior and the spread of these viruses and also to develop interventions to reduce the risk from new viral threats. And I was gonna bring, but I totally forgot, uh, 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 a new uh, document developed by Predict with others, and that is uh, living safely with animals and bats. And I could imagine a, a building like this might have some bats <laughs> as well. So it, uh, I, uh, you can see the, uh, I, 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 uh, the, the threat from bats and rats and other types of wildlife is very apparent even in the United States. Finally, I just want to say the contribution of the PREDICT program to what we call the One Health approach is very, very important, and that is dealing with infectious disease threats in a unified manner that involves not only health, but also agriculture, livestock, the environment, uh, and ecology all together, so we have a multi-sectoral response. So I look forward to the presentation today and also to some uh, the excellent work that the PREDICT project will do from now to the end of its program. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Richard. We appreciate that. I have a presentation to give on our, a little bit more background on our uh, global health program here at Smithsonian and then as an introduction to the rest of our team working on uh, PREDICT. Um, the program here at Smithsonian was founded on the One Health concept of which we're all very familiar with, with the idea that if we're going to be looking at uh, saving species, uh, it's, it, it's important to look at a holistic approach. So whether we're looking at saving an endangered rhino or people or the environment, we very much want to make sure that we're all working together. For many decades, as we know, human medicine and veterinary medicine often traveled side by side. And increasingly over the last, uh, last decade or so, we've learned uh, more and more to work together to um, to address, uh, to try and answer some of our biggest questions and to address some of our biggest challenges. Very fortunate here to be part of Smithsonian because when we were offered to be part of this uh, great partnership, um, the leadership here with uh, Steve in particular and uh, Dr. Will Pitt as well were very interested in helping to create the space for us to uh, work m uh, more at this level and with Dr. I mean with uh, Molly Fannin who's the director of our in uh, international relations office. So within the program, we have uh, three main pillars. One is with uh, wildlife health and conservation, where our teams work internationally to address more wildlife health issues. We have an emerging infectious disease public health pillar in which we work with our partners to look at the, uh, the interface between humans, animals, uh, humans, wildlife, and domestic animals. That's the part of PREDICT that we're so proud to be a part of. And then the last part, which is very key to Smithsonian, is the uh, training. If we want to make sure that what, everything that we're doing is sustainable, it's important to us that we, don't, uh, that we don't take on the work ourselves, but we look to partner with countries and develop that capacity. It's one of the reasons uh, that the PREDICT uh, program was such a natural fit for us, because under the leadership, that's exactly what we'll hear more about, the style. And the, the goal is to develop, have um, country leads from that country with um, uh, actually carrying on and forming that work. So with the global health team, we have a team in, as Steve said, that we work, um, our, the countries that we work most uh, frequently in are Kenya, and we have a, a, a Africa program, as well as Asia, and Myanmar in particular. This really gives us the chance to do several things and uh, leverage a lot of our resources. Within Asia, uh, within Myanmar in particular, not, our, not only are we working on um, collecting samples for um, emerging infectious diseases and training, uh, uh, training staff as well, uh, we're also looking at the wildlife trade. The penguin on the bottom right, as, as most people know, not penguin, uh, pangolin is the most trafficked animal. 
Uh, we have a, we partner with other teams within Smithsonian to work on elephant health and rewilding elephants. And then as we're looking at um, some bat movements, uh, not only do we uh, um, work with our colleagues in Myanmar to collect bats and trap bats and collect the samples that then go to the laboratory, um, but we also put collars on them. So and we're working with our GIS team here at SCBI and, and I mean, Mark, because it'd be really great to know if we get a really interesting sample from that bat. Where is that bat? And is it in contact with people? Did it cross a border? Is it in India? For me, this is a really great example of how part of our goal is to harness all the great scientific expertise we have here at Smithsonian, whether it's a molecular diagnostician, a GIS specialist, a landscape ecologist, clinical vets, pathology, geneticist. We really have a broad uh, range, and this, uh, again, PREDICT has been an amazing opportunity for us to further leverage that, those, those partnerships to make a real difference in the world. In terms of partnerships, um, as we all know, uh, we, no one can go it alone, and that's something else I, I, that I feel like we are very proud of, that uh, it's important within our team to be a good partner, and we can all leverage each other's work. Uh, we have great partners within the Smithsonian and then within the states, uh, UC Davis, EcoHealth Alliance, uh, in particular, are, are teams that we work with um, very frequently within Smithsonian. As Steve mentioned, we've got Museum of Natural History and the Outbreak Exhibit. It's a great way of showing our work to, to, everybody, to, uh, to the public. Uh, within countries, it's, uh, we work with our country coordinators. This is an example, oh, um, example of, of our teams in Myanmar, working with our Burmese colleagues, and of course with USAID as well. Without USAID, we wouldn't be doing this, or we wouldn't be having, we still have projects, but it wouldn't be this large program that has such a broad uh, impact. Uh, one of the things that we do, and we'll hear more about that uh, in a little bit as well, is we, we make sure that we're training the next generation, so we're working on uh, appropriate uh, capture techniques, appropriate sampling techniques, all the while making sure that people are safe, so we want to make sure that we're protecting human health, we're building the laboratory capacity, but then also uh, make, uh, making sure that the results that we get back are engaged with the community to, sh to show that we are really having uh, a, 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 an impact. As uh, our team is mostly veterinarians, and if we're going to be ta uh, talking about the importance of One Health and, the, uh, and how, how critical it is for um, the uh, medical profession and the veterinary pr profession and ecologists to work in close contact, uh, we do in Myanmar. Our team is led by an uh, MD and a DVM together. It's quite nice. A little bit of a side note in terms of reaching out to the human uh, community, Dr. John Mazette, who I'll be introducing uh, uh, shortly, was uh, the speaker at Grand Rounds at Children's National Medical Center this morning. The auditorium was packed beyond standing capacity. And afterwards, the medical community was really, really embracing uh, PREDICT, USAID, US, UC Davis, and, and our whole project in terms of uh, what we've accomplished so far and where John expects to lead the team. So as veterinarians, we all knew that we'd be working to save, I knew that I'd be working to save endangered animals at one point. Never really uh, knew that I would have the opportunity to utilize a lot of what we're doing to also uh, translate that to um, uh, the human population. This is a, a photograph by one of our veterinarians, Don Zimmerman, of Turkana women in northern Kenya with wh whom we work to uh, safeguard their community and as well as some children outside the community, outside the uh, Lino Cave in Myanmar. I'd like to end with a picture that I, I think embodies the face of One Health in Myanmar. This is Dr. Anmar Eng on the, on the left. She's a physician I spoke about, and Dr. Dr. Mark Valtudo on the right, the veterinarian I spoke about. Uh, this embodies, what I think, what we want to do for our PREDICT and USAID, the, the idea of partnership, leveraging each other, working together, and this is one of the um, pictures of which I'm most proud. This team is wonderful. Um, next, I'd like to invite up our, at least introduce uh, um, our, uh, our PREDICT team, starting with Dr. Jana Mazet, who is the, the, the Global Director, as well as the uh, Director of the uh, One Health Institute at UC Davis. Peter Daszak, who is the Eco Health Alliance um, Oh, right, right over here, and um, modeling and analytics lead for PREDICT. Dr. Tracy Goldstein, who is our pathogen detection and lab implementation lead. 
as well as Chris Kreuter Johnson right over here, uh, the surveillance lead for the team. Please welcome me, uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Mazet. Thank you so much. And <clears throat> excuse me. I just want to um, thank the wonderful introductory remarks coming from all three of you because they really hit on a main topic that I wanted to um, focus on, and that is the power of collaboration, cooperation, and capacity strengthening. And um, I really felt that the comments there and then the nice video that Mark and the Smithsonian team have worked so hard to make really gives you a little window into how this team all works together and works in country to strengthen capacities from within. And while that was going, I was getting WhatsApps from our other countries going, Myanmar looks great. How come we don't have a cool video like that? So you can see how connected in Tanzania they're watching this video and they're here with you now. And I think that is something that is changing in the world that's going to help us prevent pandemics and hopefully get on top of epidemics before they get out of control. And that's really what we're all about. So I'd like to thank the Smithsonian for welcoming us and hosting us and being a wonderful partner in the project, as well as U.S. Agency for International Development for really making this investment in the future of the world. I feel better for my kids, but hopefully my grandkids, hopefully soon, in case the kids are watching. Um, and, um, and then also other colleagues that are here, because we operate under the Global Health Security Agenda now, and we work very closely with Department of Defense, CDC, and other partners, all the ministries and countries. So I'd like to quickly just highlight that for you, and then I'm gonna let some of our other team members really take you into the details of some of the project. Today we really want to get to show you how we're trying to help strengthen global health, um, but also um, how we're, we're down the road looking to the implications of our findings. So we'll share some findings, but it's really the impacts, the long-lasting um, pieces that we want to think about with you and gather information from you, our colleagues, so that we can um, make our findings over this next year even more useful. Uh, so Richard mentioned um, that that community engagement piece, which I think is also super critical, the behavior change piece. We all have a hard time changing our behaviors and convincing other people to change behaviors that have been going on for centuries and even longer. It's super um, hard to do. Why do we need to do that? Maybe we're okay. Maybe we've seen what's coming and, and there's not much, that much more to find. Just a few years ago, um, folks said we've discovered everything there is to discover out there. But as the human population has been growing and growing and moving into more and more areas and becoming more global and moving around the world, we're seeing on average of three emerging viral disease risks every single year. So science and history is bearing out that we're not correct. We have not found everything. And in fact, I hope to illustrate to you today with the team that while we haven't found everything, you shouldn't be horrified about that. We can get the information we need to be prepared. And I think that's what we're really trying to do here, even though the population is continuing to grow. Those epidemics and pandemics have horrible costs, including, most importantly, the loss of life, human loss of life. But if you look at the costs uh, economically, there is also an, a sincere argument to be made here. And that is, when we respond to these large outbreaks, it costs us on average about $40 billion to respond. Now, that is crazy, even if we look at some of these that had very low death counts. So some of the, the huge costs come from global economic burdens of fear and for um, lack of ability to continue business. 
um, and travel, trade, all of those things. And so part of it is also an economic piece. We want to save lives, but we want to stop doing the same thing over and over again and paying the price over and over again. The World Bank estimates that it's about a trillion dollars we could expect if we have another 1918 style, the 100-year anniversary right now, uh, influenza outbreak. We can't afford that in lives lost, the disruption to whole societies and communities, as well as the cost to the planet that would really upset the whole world market. In fact, they annualize these risks and say that our estimated annual inclusive cost right now of pandemics is $570 billion a year. That's what we can anticipate if we don't get in front of this. So again, I'd like to just <clears throat> give a shout out to USAID for putting their money where all of our mouths have been about talking about One Health. And really, it has been a lot of talk, including most especially from the academic sector where I come from. We talk about it a lot, but we're not necessarily doing a lot about it. And USAID has made that investment in a very large way, and so we hope to show how it's paying off. And it's this piece, the, this is global air traffic and how mobile we are that makes us know now that we can't just think about our own health security and our own countries. We need to think about it as a global piece. Um, and that's what the PREDICT project is going to do. Richard also nicely sort of gave a little um, uh, teaser for our mission. And this is what our team um, did come together to try to address. And that was the charge that USAID put out for us, and, and it will seem kind of crazy. Really, can you preempt, can you combat, can you stop what you don't even know is there? How do you do that? And I think our team has been incredibly innovative in figuring out methods to find things when we don't really know what we're looking for. And that has been transformative, I think, in the infectious disease world. Uh, evidenced by, uh, you know, a children's hospital and children's health network wanting to hear from a veterinarian very early in the morning about um, the next epidemic and pandemic and really growing into um, some lovely collaborations at the front lines, the clinical front lines of these um, epidemics. And so the PREDICT project, as mentioned, is working and it has worked over the last nine years in uh, more than 35 countries, um, developing nations, and we work with the ministries of health, agriculture, and the environment. And even though the global health security agenda and other One Health efforts have been going strong and advocating for bringing ministries and scientists and policymakers together across disciplines and across silos, we find even now when we're going to countries and sitting folks down and trying to um, work on where should we look for sites where there's flu of unknown origin, I mean fever of unknown origin, lots of wildlife, lots of high risk transmission interfaces, people tell us this is the first time we've ever sat at the same table. We talk about One Health and we're all funded by the same mechanisms, but we don't get together. We don't talk. We, um, even if we go to a meeting, when there's a chance to break out or, uh, or sit even for lunch, we go to our sectors. And so we're really proud that our PREDICT teams, like you saw from Myanmar in the video, have been working hard to break down those silos at the most important level. Now, some of you may be less familiar with the One Health concept, the, the intersection of human, animal, and environmental health, and what that means for emerging infectious diseases. And for us, it's really bringing back to you that information that as we scour the world for the science that was done before this project started, we already could know that most of the emerging infectious diseases that I showed um, are on the rise come from animal origin. They spill over into humans. The reason they're emerging is they haven't been evolving in humans and we haven't seen them before. That also makes us more sensitive and more susceptible to them. Most of those, 75% of those, come from wildlife origins. And so that's why we're talking a lot about wildlife here. But as we strengthen the wildlife sector and do it in a conservation-oriented manner, we're also improving the lab systems, the biosecurity and biosafety level training in countries in support of the global security agenda. 
And here's really what we're talking about. In the green, there are some viruses circulating. Those um, can spill over into the animal and human health sectors. They can also spill over to animals, uh, domestic animals first in our food supply, threaten our food security and food safety, and amplify there before they spill over into people and cause disease. Really what we want is we want to see a reduction in these peaks, these epidemic curves for human and animal disease. And it's not unless or until we get in front of those curves with our information that we can make that happen. So we need to improve our forecasting, our readiness, and early detection. That means laboratory strengthening. And it's one of the things I'm most proud of in PREDICT is the amount of laboratory strengthening we've been able to do. It also means coming up with some of the novel platforms and technologies in a low cost scenario that can allow us to identify those um, potential pathogens and reduce, as you can see here in our illustration, aspirationally reduce um, the impacts to domestic animal, food supply, and human health. So what did we do? You're going to hear more from my colleagues, but we use probabilistic models to really inform where we should be putting our investment because we can't afford to do this everywhere right now. So we need to inform where we look, how we look, and get out into the field and get that data. If we are thinking about a weather forecasting system, I know you're all probably thinking about a weather forecasting system today because we're uh, bracing for big weather. Um, but if we think about that, that, that really started 100 years ago, right? When people were collecting information, it took about 50 years of collecting data before any of the models worked. So we're not going to get to forecasting where, when, and what pathogens are going to spill over next year. I hope it doesn't take us 50 years to collect that data. And I think being networked and, co and um, using information technologies and all of the partnerships we can have now because the world is so connected, we can really accelerate our ability to do this well. But we need to be in the laboratories. We need to make those laboratories prepared to diagnose, to evaluate, to identify risk and disease at the source. That information can flow back to those probabilistic models and really help us get to that forecasting stage. So what have we done? Well, here's just the, you know, you all have the infographic. And you know, people are excited, get excited about that lower uh, corner where we talk about the thousand or more viruses, more than 80% of those being novel to the world. Those are only in viral families that have been known to cause epidemics and pandemics in people. So we're not looking and characterizing all the risks in the world, but we are trying to focus on those things that we know have the potential to cause disease and then work hard to refine that list, which we're going to talk about. So while that is sort of, you know, what the news bite tends to be, I'm more excited excited about this side. I'm more excited about the capacity building because as we're finding those viruses, what are we really doing? We're training people around the world to work together, to speak across disciplines, and to work hard and safely to identify these threats. So more than 4,000 people across disciplines have been trained and trained together to work towards a safer world. And we've been able to work in more than 60 laboratories to bring technologies that are low cost but high yield for viral threats and you're going to hear more about that. So just finishing up my little section and introduction here on capacity strengthening, I'm, I'm really proud to have been part of this Emerging Pandemic Threats Program. You can see uh, our sort of um, uh, portfolio in orange here of where we've been working and how that overlaps with the countries for the global health security agenda. So we've been an integral partner for that around the world, um, making sure our workforce is trained and that we have um, both field and lab covered. Um, that's included, and here's for the Tanzanian shout out, um, some really novel and innovative troubleshooting when we don't have biosafety and biosecurity labs in some places. Our 
colleagues are finding ways to make this happen. -y. This is uh, actually two storage containers that our, our colleagues uh, stacked on top of each other to build a beautiful molecular virology lab, the first of its kind in the country, to be able to keep this work sort of separate and safe from a lot of the other work that was going on at the university. Beautiful flow for the sort of lab guys in the room, um, keeping uh, all the different sectors separated, own generator for backup, own internet, own um, and this whole thing cost them about $40,000 to build, where at my university it would cost millions to put the same size and style laboratory into place. And then outbreaks. So we're supporting the outbreaks. Um, and again, Richard mentioned the, the terrible outbreak ongoing right now in DRC. This is just an example of a timeline of about four years of the PREDICT project. In just four years, our team supported outbreaks by um, helping w in the field, but also helping in the lab, uh, supporting technologically, supporting um, at the borders, 23 outbreaks in just that first um, session. Um, and, and we bring to that the environmental component that that we're missing from most of the outbreaks in the past and really bringing in the animal piece and the environmental piece. Community engagement, and I do have a slide of the bat book, which we probably won't have time to see, but that Richard mentioned, but community engagement is key. So we're working at those highest levels with WHO and that whole sector, but also working with the communities who are willing and able to give us their samples to say, please tell my doctor what might be here because we want to be healthier and we des need to go back to them. It's our responsibility to bring that information back to them and to help them mitigate their risk and to thank them for um, their contribution that they're making to your health and your kids' health here. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to our surveillance lead, Dr. Johnson. Thank you, Jenna. That was a, a wonderful introduction to the project, and, and thanks to all of you who are here. And I'm really honored to be talking to you about surveillance activities. So. Um, as you saw a little bit with that amazing um, video of, of the team in Myanmar doing the work that they do um, in field work, the, uh, the PREDICT approach is really an amazing proof of concept for the One Health strategy. So especially in the second phase of PREDICT, we, we implemented a concurrent surveillance strategy where I think we really established new, a new approach and are one of the first people to really comprehensively um, with our colleagues around the globe, try to sample wildlife, livestock, and people concurrently at the same time. Um, so, of course, we partnered with um, WHO and FAO especially um, on how to do this and where to do this and strategies for doing this. And then PREDICT with USAID's guidance really took the lead on sampling the people and the wildlife, which we, which we of course, do, do very well having um, so many amazing wildlife vets on our team. And the idea behind this was to really triangulate between these very different taxa to look for viruses that are shared among animals and then, of course, shared with people in spillover. And, and similarly, what we did that was really different was develop this very multivalent, similarly one health testing approach that Dr. Goldstein's going to talk a lot more about. But this approach was broad-based and done the same way across species. And that is very unusual in the world of science, um, to, to use the same tests on, on animals and people even. And, and we've worked with labs to really have them overcome their hesitation in, in working across species. And, and we, we really looked for the worst of the worst in terms of the types of pathogens um, and their near neighbors that might pose threats to global health security. And so in implementing PREDICT, and this is really just for the second phase, so from 2014 on, um, we have done this amount of sampling. I haven't really updated it since this summer, but you can see we've sampled thousands and thousands, over 10,000 people in, in um, about, over, almost 65, about 75,000 at this point, wild animals. And we have, of course, this um, really important point in the project in the very beginning where we spend a lot of time working with local partners understanding what the needs are and how to work with them closely on implementation and getting our stakeholders locally to really own the project and then we work together on the design um, across animals and humans like we're saying so that it's the same protocols the same standard operating operating procedures that are being done um, across not just the species but across all the 30 countries where we work 
Um, and then we've got, of course, all the ethical and um, um, institutional approvals, if you will, not just um, in the US, but every, in every implementation um, in every country. And, um, and then we've, of course, got to engage the international and national partners along the lines of what we're planning to do. And so I've got all that up front because you can see there's this pause before we really could get underway. And then we started really cooking. So we've got community engagement in the implementation. Um, and then we've got, of course, the training and not just in how we, how we collect the data, but the entry of the data and the standardization of the data across the project. Um, and then we brought on partners in clinics and hospitals to do a really exciting part of the project where we're looking at people with, um, with syndromes of um, clinical cases that we're most interested in. And then we've got these approvals and then we've got the community engagement again and again and again throughout the project. And so that's kind of just a snapshot of how we operate in the field. This just is to show you the very wide range of species that we've interacted with. You can imagine the amount of expertise needed to sample the, these many different species. And so that's something we're really proud of. And for the, for the human work that we really started in, in this second phase of PREDICT, we implemented in two different ways. We work in communities that we consider high risk because of the interactions that they have with wildlife specifically, also domesticated species, but definitely wildlife in terms of their livelihoods or animals that are just running around among dwellings and whatnot. And then we also, like I said, partnered with clinics and hospitals, sometimes very local rural clinics where they're seeing people with acute febrile illness. And even in many cases in some countries, sometimes both ways, these tertiary, secondary and tertiary referral hospitals where people go with really severe disease, like severe acute respiratory disease. And so we standardize, our, we standardize our approach. We work with CDC and WHO to say, what are the clinical syndromes that we're most interested in in terms of potential pandemic threat that could really alert us to something going on? And that's what we, we characterized. When we met with the clinics and hospitals, we said we want these types of patients with either severe, severe acute respiratory disease or acute encephalitis um, that had been undiagnosed. So really, what are the causes of these fevers and what can predict, sort of bring to bear on improving the knowledge, the local knowledge, as far as what these people have. Um, so it's really been an impressively um, broad, in terms of its geographic breadth program, um, where we've all been doing kind of the same thing everywhere. And we're testing them for viral infection as well as past exposure for viruses to really improve the country's knowledge of what, what are the different viruses that are occurring, where are they occurring, and who's most at risk. And we're combining that with, with again, a standardized approach where we're getting the medical history from people, where have they traveled, where are they from, what do they do for their livelihood, and some really amazing work with the behavior team on what are the behaviors and what's increasing their risk um, in terms of cultural practices and, and um, other aspects of their livelihood that could be mitigated ultimately to reduce tr disease transmission. And with PREDICT, you can see we've really honed in on focused on what we consider the high-risk interfaces. So these are the, the number of people that we've sampled and just a glimpse at their livelihood. And these are people heavily working in animal production, working in human hospitals, working in crop production, um, working in um, markets and zoos and sanctuaries, as well as people that just have a lot of animal exposure in their dwelling and where they work. And this is just an example of some of, this is a community that we work with in, in Kathmandu, and, and we've been sampling with them to try to understand risks and what they're exposed to. Um, this community is engaging increasingly in animal production, and you can see they're raising swine and chickens here. And, and we've worked to sample them um, as well as their animals and the rodents and shrews that are, that are increasingly coming in because they're also doing um, a lot of rice production right there on site. And so this is the type of concurrent surveillance that we're really mirroring in, in all, the, all the places where we've worked. We also are really careful to sample along the route of transmission, so we're concerned about um, bat guano harvesting, so guano that comes from the bats 
as was really nicely illustrated in the Myanmar video. Um, it's all, this is another example of it being done, I think, in Cambodia. Is that right, Tracy? It's being held out to dry. So we sample, we sample how people would be exposed to that. So we're sampling the guano feces right there. And then similarly, primates, really common in urbanized and settings. They're getting very um, used to people. And so, um, so we sample the saliva to see what's in their saliva when they go and bite people and they're sharing food with people so that we can really understand the threat along the line of the transmission route that, to which people would be exposed. And then similarly, we sample in natural communities. And so these are bats really good at congregating. And, and Dr. Goldstein's going to talk more about the threats that that poses. Um, but they certainly have viruses that we're very concerned about. So we sample them while they're congregating in a roost, for example, or in a cave. And then we also sample when they're out at market. And these are bats being sold at a market in Indonesia. And, and we also are really keen and attentive to sampling where landscape change is actively increasing um, exposure because we've got very forested, very biodiverse areas right next to where people are developing and starting to put pressure in terms of land conversion for agriculture and other things. And so our work hopefully is going towards characterizing risk for these viruses that we're detecting. And we've already been looking really heavily at the data we've collected in the first phase of PREDICT and starting into the second phase. And we're finding, as we suspected and as the modeling had shown, and Dr. Dezak will talk a lot more about that, that bats and primates and rodents really have the viruses with the most zoonotic potential that we're most concerned about. We also found, because we sampled these animals in a myriad of ways, that it was the oral secretions that were most commonly where we found the viruses, as well as in urine and feces. And so those are really the routes of transmission that we need to worry about. And we actually found some differential between the DNA viruses being a bit more common in the, in the oral shed um, route of transmission and the RNA viruses being quite common in urine and feces. So, so really new and interesting insight there that the world has, has yet to, um, we, we're still getting this together, but has yet to acknowledge in terms of, of how we can start to differentiate risk. And unlike any other project, we sampled in these really high risk interfaces and we found that in dwellings, in animals that were being hunted, in these very intensive wildlife management settings, as well as in markets and restaurants, um, and animals being used in trade, that these animals are shedding these, these viruses with zoonotic potential in the viral families where we were targeting. Um, we found that the viruses were much more common in live animals once the animal's been dead, so the bats that have been held out there um, being sold in the market posed less of an immediate threat. Um, in terms of risk of transmission than bats that are still alive. And, and that was true for across all the species. So really gaining some new insight. And we also looked to see what were some of the indicators for host jumping? Because once the viruses start being shared across the different animal species, um, they're more at risk of jumping over to people. Those are the highly adaptable viruses we worry about. We know from previous work that it was situations where, where animals, very diverse, different kinds of animals are being brought together um, in, in situations that normally wouldn't occur, that that's kind of the perfect mixing vessel situation for, an, for viruses to be shared. Um, and we, we similarly found that with PREDICT, with the PREDICT data, and you can see these are the viral families that we targeted in the first phase of PREDICT. We found that viruses that were sampled um, in animals that were, that were in these large market settings where you have a lot of different live animals being sold together, as well as in intensive livestock holding facilities, that these viruses were in more, more animal species, very different animal species. So a bit of a, a marker there for potential um, zoonotic transmission um, and, and what we're starting to think about um, as far as characterizing risk. Now I just wanted to shift really quickly to a couple case studies we did in PREDICT-1 um, with a colleague of mine, um, Dr. T.R. Smiley-Evans, who had a Fulbright, worked in Uganda and um, worked with the PREDICT team in Uganda to work with um, the Bachiga community and the Batwa community, um, two different groups. Um, that were really close to the Buindi impenetrable forest. They used the forest for different things. Um, um, one group used mainly for harvesting um, forest products and um, getting employed through research and ecotourism. And the other ethnic group was um, had traditionally been hunters and gatherers, um, so would have different exposures and had used the forest that way, and then had since been marginalized 
um, as, as they were asked to move out of the forest. And so we worked with them closely in the, in the clinic and hospital there um, and partnered, like I said, with the Uganda team to collect samples from people as well as do an intensive survey questionnaire to ask them what their exposures were um, to animals. And you can see the different ways in which um, people were engaging in, in working with animals or consumption of animals or just having animals around their dwelling, also really an important, another important route of transmission. And we looked um, for viruses through both the PCR detection as well as serology. And we found a, a good amount of evidence for previous exposure to quite a number of important zoonotic infections, um, most notably in this region, which has not yet had an Ebola outbreak. We, we found what we think is exposure to Ebola virus and Sudan virus, or maybe a similar virus, um, that did not cause an overt infection in people, but was very clearly more common in people for Ebola virus that had, had contact with dikers, which we think is one of those important spillover hosts in those epidemics. Um, and for, for Sudan virus, people who had contact with um, primates, again, a really important spillover host. So this, this study really shed some really good light on um, not just um, where we think we need to be looking more for reservoirs, but also um, what are potential important spillover hosts that are sort of a segue for people to become exposed in their community and for us to definitely gain more understanding of how um, these viruses are a little more widespread than, than, we, than we likely believe. Um, with, the, with the data to date. And so just another important case study, a pilot, if you will, that we're doing with PREDICT was to look for antimicrobial resistance. The One Health triangulate approach is so well suited for looking for AMR. AMR, of course, has these very complex transmission routes, and um, the PREDICT approach is really well suited for looking at wildlife, environmental sources including water as well as people and so bringing that together in the community um, we have implemented um, concurrent sampling along households with people and their animals and the wildlife that are running around um, to be able to detect um, genes in in a whole host of species. We've got the different species. I'm just showing you a highlight of the preliminary data. We found a lot of antimicrobial resistance um, in chickens and ducks and shrews um, as well as swine. And when we put them together in a network to show here's all the different genes and here's all the different species, you can see it just looks like this ocean of sharing. Um, so we're really trying to begin to tease this out and identify risk, but these things are very broadly shared. And so I just want to end up on a note talking about what really we're thinking about in terms of the characteristics of a pandemic threat. And all of these ingredients need to really be brought into the surveillance strategy. We want to be thinking about the evolution and pathogens, um, cross-species transmission, and ultimately spillover, and really keeping an eye on environmental change that ultimately will help us the most with prevention. The PREDICT effort, if nothing else, was a massive comprehensive effort. This is just for PREDICT-1, where we ran almost 500,000 tests. We had many of the samples, 15,000 samples tested, 10 different times on different assays. We found that to detect a virus, about half of our viruses, those tests to detect the viruses needed, needed to be tested across 400 to 500 species. So we really have a comprehensive task at hand. Um, with PREDICT, we have also built in sort of the epidemiology, and so we're really trying to understand, and this is some great work done with the teams in Cambodia and Vietnam, the different species. This virus was found in multiple bat species and porcupines, and then we're looking at how they're shed, how those animals are being used, um, and how, what their contact is with people. And I think one important thing we need to convey in thinking about the future, and this is an analogy usually given for influenza viruses, we don't think of them as a single species, and we think of them as this sort of swarm of bees that are always changing and evolving, and I think we really need to make sure that in any surveillance efforts, we're keeping an eye on the variability in the virus strains. And the necessary ingredients for surveillance are, of course, this risk-based approach where we need this very multivalent testing strategy to be able to detect these changes as these viruses are evolving and, importantly, as the human contact is evolving as um, populations change and what they do. And the long-term monitoring is really needed. And just to, 
to bring in the weather analogy, this is the weather service data, this is their terrestrial monitoring system. They're super worried about the gap in Africa there, that they don't have enough data coming in right there where there's this, um, this little blank spot and they're collecting data every three hours, standardized data coming in every three hours, not to mention the marine based and the satellite based and the aircraft based data collection that they have. And this is something that's really needed and I think um, our teams on the ground have been amazing at doing this in an, a really, truly biosecure, ethical approach to animal handling in the most rigorous conditions. This is the team in DRC taking cold chain out to a field site. And we used to say with USAID, with their vision that, that you know, compared to the weather satellites, this is sort of the dark sky that we have with a few little stations and, and how we really need to connect and need to improve and USAID is sending us out there um, like, you know, like a mission um, to go out and, and find this and now, now what we really truly understand is that these bright spots are the amazing team, the team that's texting Jana, um, our colleagues that have really implemented and owned this project that are now networked and can really go on to shine the light on what are the infectious disease threats and, and make our, our world safe and secure from infectious disease. And I'm gonna end with my favorite picture and turn it over to Dr. Goldstein. Thanks, Chris, short girl. <laughs> Move the microphone closer. What I thought I would do today is talk you through sort of our testing strategy and how we're gathering the data that we gather and then how we're using it and trying to understand risk of these um, potential zoonotic viral species. So as both Chris and John have talked about, we really are identifying viruses initially by consensus PCR. So what does that mean? It's sort of an old school technology that we're able to implement in more than 60 labs around the world that allows us to take, detect known viruses, so SARS and MERS, but also new coronaviruses. And that's really powerful because in outbreak situations, if the viruses change or if it's not SARS or MERS, these labs have another tool to, to then look for something new. Once we find them, we then um, want to rank them for characterization because you've seen a thousand and whatever viruses. Clearly, we can't rank all of them and probably not all of them. I mean, clearly, we can't characterize all of them and probably not all of them are important enough to really understand. So we rank them in different ways and you'll hear a little bit more about that. And then once we identify viruses we think are important, we then obviously the next step is to sequence the genomes of those. And the primary ones that we're targeting right now are corona, paramyxo, influenza, and filoviruses for the obvious reasons that you've already heard about from, from this amazing team. And then we follow up with experimental um, work to try to really understand um, can they um, contribute to risk. So I'm going to use that, um, our coronavirus work, to sort of implement and show you how we do our screening and what we find. So the, the outbreaks of SARS and MERS really brought coronaviruses to the forefront in terms of a zoonotic family of concern, and zoonotic because they were linked to, to bats in terms of where they, where they came from. And what's really interesting is there's really limit, limited information about coronaviruses in resource-limited countries, and so we wanted to be able to expand that. So we sampled, um, as sort of through the strategy Chris talked about, um, oral rectal swabs, blood, and urine from bats, rodents, and primates at high-risk interfaces in 20 countries. And then we screened them all by consensus PCR for coronaviruses. So as you can see here, we sampled more, almost 20,000 um, animals and people. The high proportion of those really were bats. And also the high proportion of positives were in bats. Over 8% of all positives were in bats. So what that really told us was that bats were probably a pretty important viral fam um, um, host of, of species to understand where these viruses were coming from. We did use a sort of a cutoff that I'm not going to get into, but through that cutoff we detected what we think are 100 unique different coronaviruses, and again, 91 of them were in bats. A small number of them were in the other hosts. So where did we detect them? What you're looking at here is a map showing bat diversity, um, known bat diversity, so when it's red meaning more bats, and when it's green potentially fewer bats, we don't know the distribution of all of those. And then the, num the viruses that we found were, are plotted, those are the little dots that you're looking at. So first thing, we found coronaviruses across the entire coronavirus tree, mostly in bats, like I said, so that really sort of suggests bats are the evolutionary source of those, of those viruses. Second, we found them all around, the, all around the world. We found the alpha coronaviruses. These are pathogens that cause um, human infections, like um, 
uh, uh, cold and other influenza type um, diseases like NL63, but also the 2B like and 2C, which are the MERS and, and SARS um, like viruses, those are the red dots. And we really found them sort of everywhere. And so, where, you know, if we want to target them, you know, how do we begin to do that? One of the other things that we found in this work was if we chose a bat species, we found somewhere between one and five viruses in, in that species, depending on how many of them we sampled. So let's say an average of two virus per bat species, if you extrapolate that to the number of bats around the world, we estimate around maybe 3,200 coronaviruses still to be detected. That's without recombination or changes or anything like that. So that's a lot, but maybe doable. So how do we go about doing that? What we wanted to do was look at what factors were associated with these bats being positive. And we found some pretty interesting things that were consistent across the globe. First of all, sample type. Chris already talked about that. We found that these coronaviruses were really heavily present in feces samples, but also oral samples. So if you want to try to target what you're going to do in your resources, oral swabs and rectal swabs are definitely a place to go. Also, very interestingly, we found a lot of these bats were positive in the dry season not the wet season. That's different than what we think about for influenza. So that means if you want to do your strategy about how are you going to go find them, you need to think about season and, and what might be happening in the animals and where are you going to go out and do that. And then the third interesting factor was age. We found a lot of the younger animals, juveniles and immature animals, were most likely positive. So you want to think about when are there more young animals, what's happening in the animal's life history that will help you to target when you might want to go out and sample them. So which bats had which viruses? Interestingly, we also found there were certain bat families that were way more associated, significantly so, with certain, viral, uh, with certain viruses. So for example, the Hippocideris and Rhinolophid bats were more likely to carry the 2B viruses, those are the SARS-like ones. And the Vestibatilionid bats were more likely to carry the MERS-like viruses. So again, if you're wanting to think about how you're going to target that, that's going to give you some clue. So then, where do we look for them? So again, what you're looking at here is we, and we did create these maps for all the different families. If you wanted to look for, say, the 2C or MERS-like viruses, what we're looking at here is a heat map of where you might find those across the globe, and these are insect-eating bats. So again, red, more likely to um, have a lot of diversity of, of um, Vesper bats. And so what that tells you is you should be targeting Asia, like we all are, um, for MERS-like viruses. But also look at those pockets in Africa where we might want to be considering thinking about um, looking for those viruses. And in fact, we, we have, and I'm going to talk about that in a moment. So looking at these, so when we do this broad screening, we create a lot of data, not really in-depth data, but a lot of data that we can use really globally to try to understand patterns and what factors might be driving viral diversity. But then once you've done that, you sort of want to kind of dig deeper and start to actually look more closely at these individual viruses to try to understand risk. And I'm going to take two examples today and show you how we started to do that. First, as I sort of alluded to, we found a MERS-like virus in Uganda. And this was found in this um, Pipistrellus bat. On an aside, from a con conservation standpoint, we had a heck of a time identifying this bat species. Kind of a problem, right, when you've got a virus that you might be of concern about and it's really hard to identify the bat. So what we're learning is, of course, the books don't really exist in many of these parts of the world. The bats kind of don't do what we think they're doing, and their distributions are quite different. So not only are we learning about viruses, but hopefully contribute a lot of information about distribution of these bats, sort of ex increases in ranges, as well as ultimately, hopefully, we'll be able to contribute more DNA or host barcoding data to GenBank to, include, to improve our ID. But back to the bat. So this bat was found um, positive for a MERS-like coronavirus. It's right there in Kosoro. This is um, one of the sites that we focus on the edge of the Bundi National Forest. And um, you can see the distribution of where, at least what we think the distribution is of this bat. And this actually also overlaps, um, and Dr. Desek may show that map, with the camel trade and camel movement from Asia to Africa. So very interesting link in terms of this, this potential virus. So the next step was, you know, based on the short fragment, it looked like it was the closest relative to MERS. So we sequenced the rest of the genome. What you're looking at here is a similarity plot. So essentially, when the lines are together, it means the viruses are very similar. And when there's a big break in them, it means that they're quite different. And so we overlapped the bat MERS that we just found, the human MERS and the camel MERS with each other. And as you can see, is this, the lines are really similar or close together across almost the entire genome 
except in the spike um, protein. Now, why is that important? The spike protein is what binds to the human cell in order to cause an infection. So we wanted to understand what is it about that what that was different, and, and could this particular spike also bind to human cells? So in order to do this, we did some modeling. The models told us probably not. It looked like the virus was too different from, from the human receptor, but we wanted to test that and see. So we took the MERS, the real MERS um, clone, and we did this with Dr. Ralph Barrick at North Carolina State, and took our virus and put its spike protein in the MERS backbone. And then we put it into cells. We first forced it into the cell to see if the virus could replicate, and it could if we forced it. And that's that sort of first um, white band that you see. But what happened was the virus wasn't able to move into the next cell by itself. So what that told us is, yes, it's a virus, yes, it exists, but no, it, it by itself cannot infect human cells, which is pretty important. So again, we found what we thought was a closely related virus, but the, the spike protein was quite different. And really, this was, it was blocked at cell entry. And for, so from that, it tells you sort of our, our concern for this particular one at this time can kind of end there because it's not getting into cells. But it also gave us some very, very interesting and useful information in that it seems like this change in this one part of the protein is what possibly allowed the emergence of SARS from bats into camels and then into people. And so that's another very critical thing for us to follow in, in terms of uh, future um, coronavirus is to understand how common does this change occur and that will also then tell us what ones we have to sort of worry about. I'm going to take you to a different part of the world now to West Africa. So in PREDICT2 we started working in West Africa, the three Ebola affected um, countries as a result of course of that large outbreak in 2013 and 2015. And USAID in particular asked us to work there to look for the potential hosts of Ebola. We're really talking about Ebola Zaire when, we, when we're thinking about that. And also for, to look for potential um, spillback. And um, as is typical for the PREDICT um, approaches, we wanted to look, of course, for hosts of Ebola Zaire, but also we're hoping to see if we could find other filoviruses or Ebola viruses out there. So the data that I'm going to share with you today is, of course, the data that has just been published in the recent paper and that Richard was alluding to. Um, and this, these samples were collected from March through September of 2016 from 535 animals, including bats, rodents, dogs, and cats. And really, these were primarily oral and rectal samples, a few blood samples. These bats are pretty small, and we did not get a lot of those. And we screened it really broadly. So we used it, our nested filovirus assay. This is our consensus PCR assay that can detect Ebola Zaire, but also new Ebola viruses. That's novel. People have been out there looking for the host of Ebola Zaire for more than 40 years. And what are they really targeting? Primarily fruit bats and testing for Ebola Zaire. We went broad. We wanted a cost broad net. We weren't really particular about what species, and we definitely wanted to not only detect Ebola Zaire, but we didn't want to miss Ebola Zaire. So we then also followed up with a genus level assay that could detect all Ebola viruses, as well as some very, very specific assays that were used during the outbreak in West Africa. We wanted to make sure we didn't miss that one. And then ultimately, when we found our new virus, the Bombali virus, we then detected, I mean, we then designed a specific assay to be able to detect that as well. And then, of course, genome sequencing once we found it. So, so this table gives you just a general example. So we tested 26 different bat species. And I'll just point out that all the cats, dogs, and rodents were negative on all assays. Um, we did not detect Ebola Zaire. That would have been maybe the more exciting paper than the one we did have. But we did actually found um, Bombali virus, or this new Ebola virus, in, in uh, six different samples from two different bat species, the Kaifron pumilus and then the Mops condylaris. These are insectivorous bats. And you can see we sampled a wide range of both insectivorous and fruit bats. And we didn't find the virus in fruit bats, just insectivorous bats. The other thing to note, small numbers are positives, right? I mean, this is, these are not common occurrences. Um, and we had to sample quite a lot of animals, which is still ongoing, in order to detect the small number of positives. So where did we um, detect them? So these, these bats, first of all, were positive um, in a, over about a week's period in May um, in three different villages with all within 20 kilometers of each other. So this suggests maybe there's a timing um, component to this, which of course we would like to follow up on. And they were all found within that one um, district, at, so far anyway, based on our testing. And you can see the broad-based um, sampling that we did. So we sampled at 20 different, 22 different sites in Sierra Leone. 
And then on the, the left there is just the current distribution that we think is known of these two bats. And so you can see that they are broadly um, spread or distributed across West and Central Africa, both of these species are. And we do, um, by the way, test, we have tested samples from these species in other countries in the previous parts of the project. So, addition, so clearly um, there's something about potentially the timing that may also be important in terms of um, where we, where, you know, when we, these positives might be found. But possibly the most important thing was these bats were sampled in and around people's homes, and these bats were positive in and around people's homes. So when we sequenced the genome, um, once we found those initial positives, what we found was that this virus was definitely within the Ebola virus group. And you can see that by how it's clustering right here. And this has been kind of the question um, about um, how this virus was, um, you know, is it, is it part of the other ones or is it its own one? So again, here you can see, nope, it's its own, its own new species within this group. The next question then was, could it affect um, human cells? So we did some in, in, um, similar experiments as what we did with the coronavirus that I talked about earlier. And in this situation, what we found was that actually, yes, this virus could by itself enter human cells and using the, the human receptor and replicate with human cells. And so on the bottom there, you're looking at a graph and that shows that the Bombali virus and Ebola acted very similarly in that the virus could get into the cells and replicate. And when you remove that receptor, and those are the red bars, the virus was not able to get into it. So it really does use, have the machinery and use it. So what's the significance of this? This is the first Ebola virus genome ever found in a bat. So that really does provide probably the strongest evidence we have to date that bats are the important reservoir for these viruses. Possibly there are different bat species that are different reservoirs for the different Ebolas. Why would they all have one? They probably have multiple ones. The other thing that this tells us is insectivorous bats play an important role in ecology. And others have suggested this in the past, and we agree that we should probably expand our surveillance for these viruses to include insect bats. But possibly the most important is that this virus can enter human cells. That doesn't mean it has, it doesn't mean it will, but that is the critical step for spillover to occur, and it has the machinery for that. And then secondly, I mean, and then the, the, the third thing is that it was, as I said, found in human, um, in human houses. So there's the potential and the opportunity for this virus to spill over. So we need to really understand, can this virus cause disease in human and has spillover already occurred? So really quickly, I just wanted to talk a little bit about that and, and what we hope to do, and not just for this virus, but what can be then applied to other viruses. As Chris mentioned, this is a data scarce science. There's not a lot of information about predicting and what allows viruses to spill over. So if we can find them and we can experimentally test them, we can start to generate more data that will allow us to predict if something could become a pathogen. Again, doesn't mean it will, but could they? So we want to understand better about how it enters host cells. Does it replicate differently in humans compared to animal cells, compared to Sudan virus versus Zaire virus? One of the things that the Ebola viruses do really well is they really in, uh, antagonize the immune response. They prevent us from being able to respond and fight off this virus. Zaire is really good at it. Resin, not so much. So Bombali, where does it fit on the scale? Is it more like Zaire? Is it more like Restin? If we can understand what makes it more like one or the other, it'll allow us to understand this further as we go down the line and find other viruses. And then finally, of course, we need to get back into the field and understand sampling the people, talking to them about their contact with animals. Has the virus already spilled over? So look for antibodies, as well as the ecological studies. Is, this the, is there the seasonal shedding of this virus in the bats? And if so, that's pretty important because you can help to change behavior. Certain times of the year, people change activities to prevent exposure. Um, and then the, sort of the last thing I wanted to end is sort of thinking as with an eye towards pandemic prevention. You know, multiple sp strategies are really needed. I think um, combining viral discovery and, and characterization of unknown pathogens is as important as that amazing work that needs to happen on the ground to understand the known viruses, develop vaccines, and develop therapeutics. Those together will allow us to have a, a more comprehensive, a more comprehensive pandemic um, approach. And the knowledge knowledge that we get from understanding these um, unknown viruses, both sort of in the viral ecology and the virus host interactions, will really help to contribute to understand and prevent pandemics as we move forward. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Desak.
Thanks very much. So I want to talk about the modeling and analytics part of PREDICT, which is actually set up to really support the work of the surveillance teams, the behavioral risk teams, and also reach out to um, other partners, um, NGOs, and communities within the framework of One Health and the Global Health Security Agenda. But actually, has been an, an incredible chance, an opportunity to take the science of understanding pandemic risk forward, uh, really in a significant way, over the past few years. So John made the analogy to um, weather forecasting and that we're, with pandemics, we're where we were perhaps 100 years ago in terms of forecasting hurricanes, which is basically, we sit here and we get completely soaked, drenched, and lose our property. In, in the case of pandemics, we also die. That's not a good thing. So can we move that science forward? Well, the good news is this project has begun to do that. So what are the big questions we need to know to begin to predict pandemics? First of all, where is the next pandemic most likely to originate? We think about hurricanes. They all start just off the west coast of Africa, and they bubble up, and we watch that and track that. Can we do the same for pandemics? Uh, what's causing them? We know that with hurricanes, well, I don't know, but it's something to do with the hot temperatures in the sea and the circulation of the earth. It should be fairly simple for pandemics. What's driving those things? Which wildlife species carry the highest risk pathogens of future pandemics? It's no good focusing only on primates because they're closely related to us based on a hunch if they're not the biggest risk to our health. Um, and if we think about future pandemic threats, we know there's a bunch of viruses out there. How many are there? Are there tens of millions, hundreds of millions? Is it an impossible problem? Or is it something we can actually come to deal with? And finally, how do we actually reduce that? Can we work on ways that we can show ahead of time are likely to reduce the risk? Otherwise, we shouldn't be spending you know, hard-won money on those issues. So I want to quickly go through some of the work we've been doing, analyzing predict data, brainstorming and, and analyzing data with other partners to answer these key questions. So first of all, a few years ago, we started looking at, can we say where pandemics originate? And we used a very simple approach. We went through the literature on every emerging disease and plotted the best guess at where it originated from the scientists working on it. And this is a map of where those diseases originate. Um, it's completely useless, of course, because it's also a map of where the scientists are working, which is a map of where they're funded to work, which explains why the US has the most emerging diseases. And the places we know they emerge from, like um, Central and West Africa, Southeast Asia, have much less. So how do we correct that? And a few years ago, we simply went through the literature and analyzed the origin of every single author, where they were working on in the papers published on infectious disease over a few decades, huge amount of work, um, and it led to us being able to say, what are the things driving these? What are the correlations with uh, commonly proposed drivers of emerging disease like human activity, climate? What things correlate to where diseases originate corrected for the bias of where people are working on them? In that analysis, we can end up with a hotspot map which shows now in a much less biased way where the risk for future pandemics is most likely to be. And this is just looking at Africa. You can see that Central and West Africa and parts of East Africa are indeed, as we thought, hotspots for emerging diseases. And you can say this is predictive. This tells us that in the future, most pandemics will originate in places that are red or yellow on these maps. And of course, um, Ebola, West Africa is one of those um, hotspots. We've really advanced this now over the past few years. And in, in the second phase of PREDICT, we've gone public with this database. It's now a completely open access. You can see the uh, URL at the bottom. It's called IDA. There's a very dodgy logo that looks like an IDA duck's head, it's supposed to. Emerging Infectious Disease Repository. So there's a lot more information. You can search. You can look at specific viruses and say, where were they found? Who discovered them? What's the evidence behind this? And you can repeat these analyses. Other groups can look at them. We've also corrected our bias analysis. So we've now got a, a, a program that, that, um, that goes out onto the web, trolls through, does word, word searches, 
and looks for every mention of infectious disease. It's not just what's published in the scientific literature. It's hundreds of thousands of data points, and it's updated weekly. Um, and we use that to reanalyze the hotspots approach. And this is our hotspots 2.0. It's a complete reanalysis. The, the important point is that the hotspots are roughly the same. The, the corrected for the bias, the hotspots for emerging diseases re remain Southeast Asia, South Asia, Central West Africa, and parts of Central and South America. Um, what's new and important is the drivers that are correlated with that. On the, on the left-hand side is a list of what's important in correlating with where the hotspots are. Human population density. So where we are on the planet, we drive emerging diseases. Why does that happen? Because mammal diversity also drives it. Where species are on the planet, where we interact with wildlife is what drives the risk. And very importantly, you see one, one element of land use change, change in pasture. So this is just a measure of land use change, global gridded data on this that tells us that where we're changing the environment, we're driving risk of new diseases. I'm going to skip that one. It's too, too boring. Um, what we've been able to do with PREDICT is to say, well, if land use change is a driver, can we actually go out and say where on a land use gradient is the highest risk? So here we are in a beautiful part of suburban Washington, pretty urban actually. Is an urban center a high risk because there's lots of people here? There's a lot less wildlife. Or is it suburbia where there are still some wildlife and a few less people? Or is it the very pristine areas, the pristine forests where the hunters go in and catch wildlife that's the highest risk? Well, we've actually used the, the data from PREDICT um, globally to, s to analyze across land use gradients where the risk is highest, where the viral diversity is highest, where the species diversity is highest, and where human contact with wildlife is highest, and, and merging all those three risk factors to say where is the riskiest place. So you can see from the low disturbance, the pristine forest, these are just bats, and this I think is Malaysia. You get this huge diversity of bats. In the recently disturbed forest, you lose species, but you increase people, and you create this disrupted habitat. And then in the very highly disturbed areas, some species persist and there are a lot more people. It turns out the highest risk from the analysis so far are the intermediate zones. So this, real, this risk of emerging diseases is really a product of what we do to the environment and how we contact wildlife within those zones. It makes solving that problem very hard. So second big question, which species carry the riskiest viruses? That's really important. If we're going to go out and do global surveillance, and these are expensive programs, we need to make sure we're targeting the right species. And we used a similar approach. We analyzed every single known virus, every single known host of those viruses. It's a huge amount of work. It took eight years to do the analysis. What we find is that um, on, on this graph, you'll see some red dots and some gray dots. The red dots correspond to zoonotic viruses from species, and you can tell by the picture what sort of mammal species that is. So if a species has more red, it's got more zoonotic risk. And you see the biggest risk there are ungulates, species that are in the wild but also in captivity. And we think the reason for that is there's quite a bit of bias to what we've done over the past few years. We've looked at ungulates to try and find new viruses. So if you look at the proportion of viruses discovered, that are zoonotic, it shifts because now you're saying, well, for species where we haven't been looking very hard, what proportion of those are zoonotic? And it turns out now you see bats, primates, and rodents as high risk. We can then do some um, detailed mathematical analyses of this and say, correct for the bias in the literature, what are the highest risk groups? And what we find is there are a few things that drive this risk. One is how closely a species is related to humans, phylogenetic distance. The other is a measure of land use, what the range of urban versus rural in, 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 um, in an area is for this species. What we find, the group that has the highest risk are indeed bats. In fact, they, they significantly shift the model in, in terms of the highest proportion of zoonoses of any order of mammals. So these really are the, the riskiest group in terms of new pathogens, and these are zoonotic uh, viruses. Now, if the future tracks the past, that means that future pandemics will, on average, originate from bats. 
Now, because we've done so much work on this, and once you've amassed these huge databases and all this, these samples, you can start to really come up with what are almost magical things. You know, can you predict where the unknown viruses are on the planet? If we can do that, we can go out to those areas and start looking for them and d discover all of the other unknown Ebola viruses. And we can do it in the most cost-effective way. So to do that, we set the target surveillance as the highest in all of those species that have so far been looked at and said, what's the relative proportion in the others and what's the missing gap between them? And because you know we, we've got this data set on every single known mammal species distribution, we can then say, where would those viruses be? And what you end up with, what I think is incredible, a map um, that where the highest number of missing viruses that could infect us are on the planet for bats, the really risky group, rodents, and primates. So we really know where we should be targeting our future work. And you know, green isn't good, by the way. On this one, green still means there's a risk. So even in the US, there are some risks. We've used this approach to look at viruses too, because one of the problems we have with PREDICT is we find a bunch of new viruses, and then we don't know, really, what the chances of some of those infecting people are. We saw from what Tracy said, some of them we can do some lab tests about the receptors and say, could they get into human cells? We still don't know if they would cause pandemics or not. So what are the traits of viruses that have made them pandemics in the past? And really this is a lot more difficult, but one thing we've, we've started to see is this thing called maximum phylogenetic host breadth. The biggest, for every virus species, they infect a wide range of hosts, some of them. The ones that infect the maximum genetic distance, evolutionary distance across all the hosts, are more likely to infect people. That's the biggest driver of risk. If you rank the virus families according to that, you see a few um, groups in particular. And what's interesting is we already know viruses from those groups. We have a bunch of, of new ones we've discovered in PREDICT. There are a bunch of others that are out there. These are viruses like Zika that have a wide host range and we kind of know about, we know a little bit about, and then we're all surprised when they emerge and cause major problems to human health. Well, hopefully this takes us a step further towards predicting that risk. Now, going back to the key goal of the modeling analytics group, how do we support what we're doing in PREDICT with this sort, these sorts of analysis? Well, one thing is we can now get a much better handle of in-country risk distribution. So this is a map of Kenya. This is work we're doing with Smithsonian um, to say, looking at the hotspot map here on the left-hand side, and then looking at things like livestock distribution, wildlife distribution, and these missing zoonoses distribution, we can begin to refine where we should be working in each country to say, are we working in the riskiest place? Because given limited resources, we need to focus on those places first. We can go to this question of, well, if we've got data on every single known mammoth, uh, mammal, their distribution, can we then say, where is the risk of future outbreaks of Ebola, for instance? So we've got every suspected host, bat host of Ebola virus. We've got data on every road network and population um, settlement in Africa. And we overlap those and run some analyses and come up with a map of where human bat contact is highest for those groups. These are the places we should expect to see future outbreaks of Ebola. It's no good just saying, oh, it's going to happen where it did before, because West Africa showed us that isn't always the case. So this is where we should be targeting our efforts. Another big question, we've done all this work on predict, are we sampling the right species? So here we've listed every um, mammal species from Bangladesh. These are the highest risk group. And as you can see, we are beginning to target the very high risk ones. So we can self-correct our sampling. We can analyze the discovery curves. And when they saturate, you can run algorithms that predict the total number of unknown viruses in each group. And this gives us an amazing capacity to say, when should we finish our predict sampling? Now, we're not, we're not there yet by a long stretch, but we, do, we are able to come up with projections of the total viral diversity in high-risk mammal groups on the planet. And that's the basis of the global virum that I think John is going to talk a little bit more about um, in the next session. I just want to finish with a couple of examples, really. Um, one major one in particular, 
looking at the surveillance from PREDICT and going back to the coronaviruses from bats, we know that SARS was a coronavirus that originated in bats, and we showed this um, in 2005. But using PREDICT sampling, we've now been able to really build out the phylogenetic tree. The original ones, the red ones at the top are human, the green ones are the original bat viruses we found, the blue are all new PREDICT um, bat coronaviruses from China. What we've found is that some of these are incredibly closely related to SARS and are able to infect human cells in the lab. And we can do this by just simple experiments without even isolating the virus. So this is a bat cave in Yunnan province. This is a picture of me a couple of weeks ago. So I'm, I've got the correct PP on. If I start coughing, you'll know why. But it's a cave that contains every genetic element of SARS, coronavirus, in bats, and these viruses circulate dynamically in there. People move in and out of these caves. They're, they're digging out guano. They're hunting and eating bats. It is a very high-risk place. So one of the things we've been doing with the modeling group is to say, can we target which human populations are most at risk? Where the virus hazard is highest, where the exposure is highest. And what we've come up with, because we know so much about Chinese bat distributions, we can identify caves in Yunnan and communities around them that are high risk. And we've actually gone out to these communities, sampled them, asked them about their relationship with wildlife, and sure enough, we've now found evidence for the first time since the SARS outbreak of these bat viruses spilling over into people. This is the beginning of an outbreak, um, potentially, and now we're in a situation where we can stop it. So it's exactly what we said we would do with PREDICT. Um, the way we're going to stop it is we're looking at intervention approaches around things like um, uh, guano mining, bat hunting, and just testing out simple ideas. Should we completely ban people from going in the caves, or is it safe? How much risk do we reduce by having people wear PPE or having them um, clean the, the hands before and after? And just running the simulations, then developing materials around that, such as the Living Safely with Bats and Other Animals booklet, that help local communities reduce the risk. Truly the goal of PREDICT in the first place. So I'm now going to hand over to Jonna, who's going to sum up the whole project and talk about next steps. Cheers. Thanks. So you heard a lot about the science, about the methods, and how we're gathering and finding all these viruses. Some of it is, is very detailed. It's interesting to the scientific community, as you can tell from the high quality publications. But what about policymakers? What about the end users that are making decisions about how resources are distributed, where we should do surveillance, what we should be looking for? And so we're working hard as well to bring that high science scientific rigor into a format that is really useful for lots of different um, types of users. And to do that, we realized we needed to start to get a handle on the risk piece, um, not just from the receptor binding and all of the pieces we're talking about from a virological point of view, but what about the epidemiological point of view? Where are people likely to encounter these viruses? In what ecological contexts are they able to spill over? They may exist in the very pristine forest, but if they don't have the opportunity to spill over because people aren't going there or there, there aren't sort of ecological disturbances, they're probably less likely to be at the top of our risk score. Why didn't we have Zika up at the top of our list and why did we know about it and know it could infect other um, species but yet we weren't really watching for that spillover event and changing, and should we have been? Well, obviously we should have been, but so now we're trying to pull together those different characteristics that never before have been put together in one scenario. So we're scrubbing the literature, we're creating knowledge, as you saw today, and we're working with the experts. So we're, we're working with experts to look at sort of you, you probably didn't hear all of them, but there are 40 different factors we were be, we've been able to identify in the literature and through our own work that likely have an effect on a virus's risk to spill over. 
And working with expert opinion, polling experts all over the world in virology, epidemiology, ecology, policy for infectious diseases, we are able to start to get a handle on the relative risks of all of those factors. And when we do that, we can come up with almost like a credit score for viruses to help us say, where should we be investing? So we're creating a website, and Dr. Zoe Grange, who's not here with us today, has been working hard uh, and quietly, sort of in her cave, if you will, um, making this happen. But um, we're creating both that paper as well as a website so that policymakers that are interested in a certain country can create the map just for that country of all the viruses that we found and predict and all of the known zoonotic viruses to date. Um, and it looks very similar to Credit Karma risk score, but it's really a spillover risk score to help um, also scientists saying, if I worked on just coronaviruses, I want to sort the coronaviruses. If I found a new coronaviruses, can I upload it and look at all those same risk factors? Well, you will be able to do that. So we're going to make it into a, a scientist citizen scientists approach so that people that are willing and able can fill out just a very short form and link to their gen bank sequence of their virus just talking about the interface and the location where they found it and then we pull all the other data for those 40 factors from public sourced literature to come up with that risk score so that's something we hope to be showing you and it'll come out i guess on social media um, in this next year but also be available and um, when we're wrapping up next year we'd like to show you um, that piece so that's one sort of critical piece to look forward to say so what you found a thousand viruses which ones do we need to worry about and we're trying really hard to look at that um, the other thing that these data are showing us and Peter alluded to this is that we can now actually identify how many viruses we expect from each host species in the world and if we look at the mammalian host hosts in the world, the water bird hosts, especially for influenza in the world, we can start to get a handle on what's out there. And so we know there are about 111 viral families, and about 24 of those have been known to cause human disease, including epidemics and pandemics. When we started this project, less than 400 viruses were known to be causing zoonoses. And unfortunately, if we look at how many viruses are out there yet to be discovered, there's probably more than a million. Um, and when we want to think about just how many of those can be zoonotic, it's probably around a half a million. So we're, we're just a trickle. Right? This project is a trickle, but it's telling us, it's informing us what we need to do to get in front of those three viruses every year that are likely to cause the epidemics, the outbreaks, the pandemics. And the global community is noticing that. And so folks like WHO and the Food and Agriculture Organization, the global health community is saying, what can we do? And if we come together, as multiple countries working together, we can actually, for less than 10% of what it would cost us to respond to one of those major outbreaks, we can actually find all of the viruses that are out there that are available to spill over and start to get that risk score for those so that we can be better prepared. The beauty part of that is as we're doing that, we're working in all of the countries to build the capacity to real time be detecting. So do we get closer to that weather service? exponentially closer as we go, much rapid, more rapidly than we did with, um, with the weather. But we're also almost immunizing ourselves as we go because we have a workforce that's being built at the same time and a laboratory system or network throughout the world that is able, when there is an outbreak, even if it's not before the outbreak happened, they're able to detect, diagnose, and hopefully stop it at its source. What we see See when things get out of control, like in the West Africa Ebola outbreak, is when it doesn't get picked up. It's expected to be something else. Same thing with Zika. We don't expect Zika to cause those problems. It couldn't have been causing those problems. We're not thinking broadly enough, so it gets completely out of control before we figure out what we can do to mitigate. So that's really what the future looks like. We can start to build this risk atlas, not just here with USAID and not just in the US, 
with U.S. scientists, but by becoming this global network of informed citizens, citizen scientists, um, we can really collect that metadata. We're working with partners also that are excellent at artificial intelligence and scrubbing the web um, for all of the information. That includes our partners at Boston Children's and Harvard with HealthMap that are that are be, are actually having better success picking up um, flu epidemics than our traditional um, surveillance methods of, of looking in the throat. So these are the kinds of technologies we need to bring together to protect the world. Um, and, and I feel optimistic. I don't want you to walk away from today going, oh my goodness, they're scratching the surface and finding just a few. I'm saying we're finding the technologies and the power of the collaborative and communicative work that can really accelerate this process so we don't just have to wait to get drenched, if you will, metaphorically. We can get in front of this problem. And while we're doing it, here we are at, at Smithsonian. All of us are coming from a conservation place. We're also discovering the mammal and bird biodiversity, the new species like Tracy mentioned, um, maybe a new species that we found that MERS like Uganda, uh, virus in Uganda. Um, so it has these synergistic benefits um, where we're collecting tons of data um, that can be used for other efforts as well. And then back to the economic argument. And Peter will be available to answer more questions about this. His team has done a wonderful job trying to say, if we can just address one piece, if we can just make a couple new vaccines to the high risk viruses that end up on our target, if we can just change a little bit of behavior, how much can we save? Can we get that huge number, that $40 billion per um, outbreak to trillion dollars um, for a, a big flu pandemic, can we get that $570 million annualized um, cost, billion dollars annualized cost, can we get it down? And just with baby steps, we can start to drastically reduce those costs um, as you see here. Um, so we're hoping that our PREDICT work will be able to continue, but that we will also be able to contribute um, to the global community uh, and uh, work together with folks all over the world. Because as we know, we can't just keep doing it the same way we've been doing it. Um, it, it the costs are too high um, and we need to, to move on and do a better job. So with that, I'll open it up. If the panel could come back up, we'll, we have a few minutes for um, questions and happy to answer those with you. Thank you, John. We're gonna be putting seats up front for the panel. We'll be taking questions from the audience. Um, thank you very much for a very informative update as well as uh, underlying the collaborative approach that got us this far. Does anybody in the audience have any questions for anyone on the panel? Yes, please. On your last point about the spillover into, let's just say, taxonomy, I mean, I guess a path from this project to, since we're sitting in the Smithsonian, this project, recent bat tox taxonomists around the world. I mean, how strong is that pressure out? I can see it going to virologists and the medical community and there, but you're talking way out on the boundaries of the galaxy, at least from how I hear it. Yeah, from, oh, don't think it's on. Oh yeah, it is, okay. Um, a lot of what we're doing is is creating that foundation for the next generation of scientists. That's important to all of us uh, because we want to get you know to that better place for epidemics and pandemics. But it's also important for our teams that I mentioned working all over the world. Those those teams are uh, have that next generation of scientists. Some of them are moving on from our project, getting PhDs, and becoming um, entomologists. We sort of have a dearth of entomologists in the world that they were, it was a huge discipline. And then the, the, the entomology discipline sort of moved in a, a different, very positive direction, but we lost all the, the uh, basic entomologists that could even um, 
you know, identify phylogeny-wise the, um, the mosquitoes and the different vectors. Um, same with hosts, uh, and as well for virologists, having that material. So we're, we're looking forward to collaborating with folks and, and making the data available, and even the samples belong to the countries, but the samples available, especially to the in-country scientists, um, to really become the next better virologists and epidemiologists, so it's a great point. I just <clears throat> wanted to add, of course, huge concern in the bat conservation community, and obviously, as I we, we sort of said, we're conservationists as well, and so um, one of the meetings recently was the bat infectious disease meeting in Colorado, and the bat, um, biologists came to that as well, and that was a really good opportunity for people to talk. Um, because I think, I, I didn't talk about that, but our biggest message is, you know, don't kill the bats um, for many, many reasons, including conservation, but also that doesn't actually change or decrease infectious disease transmission. So I, it, it looks like sometimes it could be an us versus them, and I really hope, and that there'll be more meetings like that bat meeting where we figure out how to work together because conservation of the species and understanding the species and the distribution, which hopefully we can add to, is as important as understanding the viruses because it's going to be that combination that needs to happen. So, yeah. yeah. To that end, our team, as well um, as all the scientists we work with in the other countries, in all of our papers and press releases and anything we put out, we always make sure there are lines in there that say, Bats are important to ecosystems, they're pollinators, uh, they're controlling insects, and if you kill them, they will make more bats that will shed more virus. So um, that's the biological response. So we, we sometimes the journals want to cut that out, and we, we feel really strongly that that protective mechanism needs to be in there. Anyone else? Yes, sure. <laughs> I can ask questions forever. I, I think the next one is really the sustainability of the program. May, many of you work on it and know where that's going. What's the time frame of this program and where's, what's the transition to the next if this one's ending? There was a reference to maybe this one ends. Well, we're, we're on five-year cycles, so we're four years into our second five-year cycle with USAID. We do have other collaborations with DITRA and DARPA and other agencies that are continuing. We're also um, hoping and, and working with our in-country teams to look for other sources from their own governments as well as uh, other federal sources. So we never really know what's coming down the pike in uh, the U.S. federal system, uh, so we're always um, hoping that we're making a difference as we go and that, that we have steps where we can show our progress and then we can continue to partner with those that are interested in, in moving it forward. And there, there is a lot of interest. Um, it seems to be um, resonating as a high priority for, for many folks, so we're hopeful. Anyway. Um, in addition to what Jana was saying, there are different parts of our uh, government that are uh, expressing a little bit more interest as well. As, there, as part of the PPFST, Pandemic Preparedness Forecasting Science and Technology Panel, it's part of um, OSTP, uh, that this team has recently recognized the importance of modeling as well as behavior. Um, and how human behaviors and cultural norms can affect uh, an outbreak. And so we are currently working on putting together, uh, and ho again hosting it here at Smithsonian, a joint workshop, a two-day workshop coming up this fall where we're um, combining um, both modeling as well as behavior. And that's an example, I, I do see that as a sustainability issue, which is the project you know, isn't just going away. I think the more, that, the more information that's gained, the governments are listening, other governments, including uh, um, our own, and wanting to, to get ahead of that, and developing these working groups that really need to be part. And then, uh, obviously, with this information, we'd feed back to Congress and the White House, which is where we need to be. Yeah, and, and I think, it, it, what's interesting, I think that it, it's kind of too late. Um, USAID's opened a Pandora's box on, on this type of work, and, it, you know, as you go around the world now, you see um, so many um, local scientists, for instance, China or Thailand or Indonesia that are focusing on this approach. And, and it's so productive and so interesting and so useful from a public health 
sustainability point of view, that that's going to carry on no matter what. And local governments are already chipping in to support those programs. There are scientists in Europe funded by the EU to do very similar programs. And there's just been a whole new growth in um, understanding viral discovery in wildlife and what it actually means in terms of public health risk. This is a new type of science and ac action through public health that's not going to go away, I think. Thank you. So I saw that you're working with the World Health Organization, but have you involved any of the development banks like the World Bank or the Asian Development Bank or the IDB? Yeah. Um, actually, yes, we're working pretty uh, closely with the World Bank um, to look at their One Health approaches. They've really um, brought the, world, the One Health perspective into just about everything they've done. And one thing we're trying to do is to look at the economics of these diseases and say, can you make an economic argument that prevention, and it's pretty obvious you can, is, is better than um, business as usual. The return on investment for a big project like the Global Viron Project is about $95 to one, which is incredible. And, and it just puts some framework on the, um, the sort of gut feeling that prevention is better than, um, than waiting to cure it after it's started. So World Bank have, have absorbed that. Um, I don't know about the Asian Development Bank yet, but we'll see how that goes. But yeah, there is strong interest. Well, I'd like to again thank the Smithsonian, our partners here. Also, um, not everybody could be represented here today. Um, I mentioned the ministries and partners in all of the countries where we work. They're, they are the blood, the lifeblood of this project. They're critically important. Also, a couple of really critical partners, Columbia University, Metabiota, and Wildlife Conservation Society that just aren't, don't happen to be on the panel today, but that are um, keeping all of this work going. Um, and, and other laboratory partners. Um, I mentioned I mentioned some IT partners, but I, I just really want to thank all of those folks that couldn't be with us today. And you again, thanks. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. I'd like to do a, spe a special shout out to the global health team here at Smithsonian that helped organize everything. So please join me in welcoming our team here as well as the panelists. <laughs> And of course, Dr. Pitt, Dr. Montfort as well, and uh, USAID as well. Thank you everybody for coming. You're, you're free. <laughs>